Good morning. All right, so I have some questions for you. You ready? What is this called? Duct tape? Duct tape? This is red duct tape. It's duct tape. All right, so here's some questions for you. How many of you have ever used duct tape as a Band-Aid? All right, these are my people. How many of you have ever used duct tape to hem your pants, temporar- hopefully temporarily, hopefully, all right? Or a jacket, maybe? All right, how many ever use duct tape to patch a water hose? Mm, that's kind of crazy. How many have ever purchased or made a duct tape wallet? Somebody gave me one. So this is going to be, so what I'm about to tell you is theologically argumentative, but I'm going to say it because I believe that it's true. Everything I say, it's not found in scripture, so you're going to have to go on your own, but, uh, but I'll give you the reason why. Here we go. You're not going to like it. <clears throat> God does not use duct tape. I know. It's, it's theologically just terrible to say, but here's the truth. Why? Why? Because when God fixes things, he fixes them, you ready, you ready, you're going to, Randy, you're going to hate this, the right way. And, but the problem is he doesn't always fix it as quick as we like. And some of you are going through something right now and you're like, God, you could just duct tape this real quick and, uh, and we'd be good. And yet you're going through a valley, you're going through a hard time, you're going through difficulty. And when we look back in the book of Esther, we're getting to the end now. And this uh, message is titled, Such an Ending. And today we're going to talk about three ways to trust God's timing. Three ways to trust God's timing. So, so here's a question for you that maybe you've never heard. Are you prepared for God's blessing? Are you prepared in your life for God to change that thing that you're frustrated about or dealing with or that discouragement that you have, that thing you're walking through? Are you prepared for Him to do what's next? If He actually answered your prayers, would you be ready? And I think a lot of us wouldn't because we're so focused on what's wrong, we haven't really focused on fixing and being ready for what God wants to do next. So I'm going to talk about those three things today, because here's what I know. If you today, or if one of your friends is in a valley, when God takes you through a valley, here's the good news about valleys. There's not a lot of distractions. And so you, in that, when Jesus talks about the two commands, loving God and others, he, those are two things that we really can work on when we're in a valley, when we're going through a hard time. God Am I loving you with all my heart, soul, and mind? God, am I loving others? And then if you'll notice, my mentor, Dave Daniel, who would have loved the Georgia Tech victory yesterday, uh, but he, he, uh, he would have said, uh, Eric, there's actually three commands there, even though it's two. He said, because it says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you don't love you, you can't love other people. And so those are the things when we're in the valley that God calls us to work on. Why? So that we can be prepared for what he does next. So I'm going to look at these and you'll see kind of where we're going as we walk through the end of the book of Esther. And um, if, you, if you want to look up Purim, uh, that's I think close, closer to how it's pronounced. And I'm a hillbilly, so I pronounce everything wrong. Uh, anything that's, so if you hear me say a Greek word, I probably said it like a hillbilly. The good news is the Bible was written New Testament, Koine Greek mostly. And Koine Greek means, or it, basically it's a country Greek, it's not a highfalutin Greek, so I feel like the Bible fits me pretty well. So, number one, act when it's time for resolution. There will come a time when you may be ready for God to move, and the note I wrote this morning is missing, that is not good. So hopefully, eh, you might just get a random sermon today. All right, here we go. Esther, chapter 8, verse 3 through 6. Esther again pleaded with the king. So remember, he said, you know, uh, uh, he, the enemy was killed. Uh, uh, Haman was killed. Um, and so they've gotten that out of the way. But the law still stands, and that's what happens next. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which sounds like something Pop I would say. Agagite, agagagaga. All right. You'll 
think of that all day long. <laughs> You'll be like, Haman the Agagite. All right. Which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. That's like the quickest way to get her to quit crying. He's like, she's crying. What do I do? What do I do? See, all the guys now are like, could I get a gold scepter? That would be great. Like, it's going to be okay. That doesn't work for us. But anyway, so if it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards him with favor and thinks it's the right thing to do, and if he's pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman the son of the Agagite devised and wrote to destroy the Jews. Hamaditha, by the way. Uh, to destroy the Jews and all the king's promises. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? Now, Esther, remember, was not letting her emotions run her. We talked about that last week. She had two different parties. She now was, was presented to the king three different times. The first time she came in, she could have been killed, and then she had two parties. And after the first party, he says, what is it you want up to have my kingdom? And she's like, come back for another party, which I don't know about you. I would have run in during the first time and gotten killed, and the book of Eric would have ended with, and they all died, and it's Eric's fault. So uh, but she comes in, and then she has a party, and then she has another party, right? And now she realizes, okay, the king now understands what's going on. He knows my identity has been revealed as Jewish. Everything is in the front. So what does she do now? So now she's ready and actually weeps before him. She had been holding all of this in, and finally she lets him know everything she needs. Which, by the way, we're not going to read it today, but he basically says, yeah, can't do that. Can't repeal something I've already wrote and written, so let it be written, so let it be done, is already done. So you got to figure it out. And I'll tell you what, I don't know what to do. My name is Xerxes, and, and I've already lost battles, and I'm a mess. And so uh, uh, let Mordecai figure it out. And so Mordecai basically writes letters that say the Jews can take up arms. They can defend themselves. So even though on that day people are going to attack them, they're allowed to defend themselves. They basically can arm themselves. They basically can be ready to stand in defense. Now, why did all that happen? Because even when they were going through crisis, they didn't just focus on what was wrong. They didn't just focus on the danger. They focused on what can I do? How do I prepare? How do I do what God wants me to do? And let me tell you something just practical for you and for me. When you're going through a valley, whether it's a, a relationship, whether it's a work issue, whether it's a health issue, whether it's a financial issue, there's sometimes that you can't control, by the way, you can never control other people, but there's times where you can't control a situation either. There's nothing you can do about it. So what does God call you to do? Work on you. Work on your relationship with Him. God, I need your presence. I need your peace. God, is there anything inside of me that's messed up? Is there anything that's broken? I love what it says here in uh, James chapter 4. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, grieve, mourn, and wail. What is that about? That's about self-examining. Is there anything messed up in my life? Some of you have gone through relational challenges and you're out of one relationship and can I tell you what the problem is with a lot of people? They messed up their first relationship and now they have bad habits and they take them into the second relationship hoping that some miracle will happen and they will just be better. The truth is you've got to work on your stuff or you're going to be right back where you are. I've told as a teenage counselor for years and helping people with their teenagers, one of the things I told parents over and over was if you just take your kid and plop them somewhere different and their heart hasn't changed and their idea hasn't changed, they're going to have the same problem over here that they had here. It's okay to move them when you need to, but make sure that you've dealt with what the real problem is. And I would say that for all of us. And then it continues, change your laughter to mourning, your joy, to gloom. And then here's the most important part of this. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. And I want to encourage you to do that. Listen, 
every day. Start your day with some time in the Bible. Uh, maybe end your day with time in the Bible. However you want to study the Bible, whatever's a good time for you. But every day, humble yourself before God. Say, God, like David did, say, God, is there any wayward way in me? Is there any area of my life that I've not surrendered to you? Is there any area of my life when I'm doing what I want to do, but not what you want to do? God, are there any hurts in my life that are affecting me? Is there anybody I haven't forgiven? By the way, unforgiveness will get you. I, I tell people all the time in new members class, and I don't say it in every class, but, but I'll say to people, if you're mad at your last pastor, please don't join our church. And I've gotten some funny looks over the years, by the way, with that one. Every once in a while, I was like, how did you know? Well, I didn't know now, but I might know soon. Because you're mad at the last guy, guess what? At some point, you're going to get mad at me. I'm probably worse. And so you have to forgive people in your past. Why? Because you carry that stuff into the present. I don't want you to hurt your other relationships. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Lord, help me to walk with you. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your love. Read his word so that you can make sure your heart and your mind line up with what God wants. Number two, not only when you're ready for a resolution, obey during times of redemption. So redemption, you know what it is if you had public stamps. I used to go into the redemption store. I can remember my parents would give me all the stamps, and that was like, I won the lottery. They're like, you can just have the stamps. I don't feel like messing with them. And we had the coolest store in Miami. We'd go in there. Big glass store with glass cases and you'd find the stuff and you'd turn in the stamps and you would redeem the stamps for whatever the item was. The truth is for all of us, that's what God has done for us. And, and here's the whole thing. When you're getting ready, redemption also means a rescue from a mistake you've made. You ever make a mistake? You ever wish you could just somehow start over? You just push that button and go back seven seconds to what you said, right? Seven years. Somebody said seven years, right? So many times the way God gives us, gets us ready is not the big things we think they are. It's, the little, it's being faithful in the little things. I was thinking about when I, when I first helped plant a church almost 30 years ago. And even before that, doing youth ministry and setting up for events and all. How did I learn that? Well, when I was in junior high, I joined the band. And I was the drummer. And the drummer gets bored during band practice. Any, any former drummers in band here? Am I right? Am I right? You get bored. And, and so I can remember there were some songs that had like 35 rests. And then they're going to go... Ding! I mean, it just bore, right? So the band director, not knowing what to do with four drummers, said, uh, hey guys, would you go uh, straighten up the auditorium, set up the chairs, set up the sound system, get us ready for our concert? So guess what I learned? I learned how to set up chairs. I learned how to set up sound systems. I learned how to tape stuff down. I learned how to check on stuff. And guess what? When you become a youth pastor or a pastor of a church that's moving, you got to learn how to tape down cords and set up sound system and learn how to do all that stuff. God was preparing me. Can I tell you that in junior high and high school, I hated that. Who wants to get sweaty before you have to go back to class and sit next to girls, right? And yet that's what I did. Actually, now that I think about it, that explains it. Okay, sorry. Esther 9, verse 16 and 17. This is what happens next after he writes the, the, the rewrite here. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder, which basically is showing their motivation. They were motivated to defend themselves, but they weren't trying to get a bunch of stuff, so they left it. It was like, a, like an honoring to God. It was like an offering to God. I'm not going to take this. And then it continues. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar. By the way, that's springtime. And by the way, they celebrate Purim every year in Israel and around the world. You would go to New York City. You would probably see a drunk rabbi walking around because the one time they actually encouraged drunkness, which is a crazy thing to think about, but it's true because Esther, I guess, encouraged it. I don't know. All right. So this happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar. On the 14th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. What happened? God reversed 
the irreversible. There are things in your life that I know you cannot fix. I, I know, I know. There are things in my life that I can't fix. But, and I would love for God to just duct tape it. God, could you just make that happen and that would be easy? But God has a way over time of reversing the irreversible. Like I told you last week, we are microwave people with a crockpot God. And so, and he's not a duct tape God. Sorry, duct tape lovers. I, maybe he makes wallets, I don't know. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, and this is what I talked to the kids about today. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. One of the reasons that we struggle sometimes when it comes to uh, being redeemed and understanding that God wants to bless us is because we don't understand what God has paid for us. So some of you look at, in the mirror and yell at yourselves. Some of you guys, when you work on your car because of how you grew up, you say your last name loudly and like a cuss word. You use your own name as a cuss word. You know how I know that? Because I, I do that. Brookins! When I would spill a glass, my dad would say, oh, pulled an Eric. Some of you, I, I saw this post on Facebook. I thought it was great. It said, it said being an adult is figuring out that you were holding the flashlight correctly, your dad was just mad about what he couldn't do. And so some of us have gotten so used to that that we feel that way about ourselves, and we're not only hard on ourselves, we're hard on other people, and it's hard to overcome those things. When you recognize what God has paid for you, the redemption that you have, what He's given for you, you realize your value more valuable than Lucille Ball glasses. I know, hard to believe. Is that a Lucille Ball purse? I want to know how she had a Lucille Ball purse. Okay, never mind. Because, All right. Melody Car Carlson said this, Sometimes we have to let our dreams go in order to allow God to bring them back to us in His way and His timing. I love Antique Roadshow. I know I'm weird. Some of you like it too. My favorite one is about the guy with the blanket. And the, guy, the lady says to him, so where have you been keeping this blanket? Oh, I just got it hanging over a rocking chair at the house. Is it in the sun? Yeah, it's right next to a window. It's like, yeah, you might not want to do that. This blanket's worth $100,000. It's a Native American blah, 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 blah blanket. And the guy's like, ooh. Some of you are going to get to heaven and recognize the value that God has put on you. And on this earth, you've forgotten it because somebody else told you you were not valuable. But you are. Number three, don't neglect time for rejoicing. Some of you are guilty of this. It's easy to do. Why? Because as we go through life, it's like going through a parking lot with speed bumps. You see the speed bump coming, right? And you're paying attention to the speed bump. You're paying attention to the speed bump. You make it over the speed bump. And guess what you're doing next? Looking for the next speed bump, right? So you see the next speed bump coming. You look at that speed bump. When's the last time you said, God, thanks for that, helping me make it over that last speed bump? Because the truth is, in this world, you will have trouble. There will always be something coming. There's always going to be the next thing, whether it's something big or something small. There will always be something. And if you're not careful, you'll be so focused on that, you won't appreciate all that God is doing. Chapter 9, verse 20. Mordecai recorded these events. He sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually. They still do this today. On the 14th and the 15th day of the month of Adar is time when the Jews got relief from their enemies. And as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy, do you need that today? And mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Last Sunday afternoon, 65 family members were at our house to celebrate my mom. Can I tell you that we ate food? Do I, do I need to point that out? D there, were, there were balloons. There were th my, my 
niece made these coolest cookies in the world. She has a cookie business. I didn't know you could have a cookie business, but she's got a cookie business. And so all of these things to celebrate my mom, and my mom was so honored. Can I tell you something, though? We had to go out of our way to make that happen. We love my mom. We care about my mom. We think my mom's awesome. But guess what? We had to make a special time to celebrate it. Can I tell you something for you? Make time to celebrate what God's done for you. Don't get so busy just trying to survive, not just staying alive, staying alive, ah, 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 right? Try to, try to find some things to say, God, thank you that I'm still alive. God, thank you that I'm still breathing. And, and, you know, if you have to say things like, doctor said my oxygen's down to 22%, I don't think you'd ever be able to say your oxygen's down to 22%, but, you know, the doctor told me to say, God, thank you that I'm still here. And one day you might be saying, God, thank you that I'm still... Hey, Jesus, what are you doing here? And that's okay. That's okay. Your worst day is your best day. Philippians 4, 4 and 5 says this, Rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. When everything's going great. When life is just the way you wanted it. When the Smurfs come walking in. When Barney is... No. Rejoice in the Lord always. So it's like, Lord, even on this day, I can rejoice in you. Even when I'm working on the engine and I break the bolt off. Even when I'm installing the toilet and I start tightening the bolts and all of a sudden crack. Oh, no, that didn't happen. I didn't do that. I replaced two toilets yesterday. You don't want to know the story. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. And then I love this. Let your gentleness be evident to all. By the way, I wish more Christians were known by their gentleness. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And then, I love this, the Lord is near, which basically means God is paying attention to you. Remember, no good deed, listen to what I'm about to say, no good deed goes unnoticed. Next time you think no good deed goes unpunished, I know that's true, but God notices. No good deed goes unnoticed. God notices what you're doing. Are you working on you? Are you allowing God? Are you going through a valley and it just feels really dark? Then say, God, is there something you want to do in me while I'm in the valley? Is there something I need to fix? Is there, do I, how can I fall more in love with you even in the middle of this trial, this struggle, this pain? And so that's my prayer for you. At the end of this story that you'd realize that God has your story. And when you surrender your life to Him, guess what? It's going to be a great ending no matter what. Whether it's a sudden ending or not, it's going to be great. Everybody wants to go quick. I've never had anybody say, I would really like to linger for years and be miserable. But yet when we lose somebody in a hurry, we're devastated. But they're not. If you're a believer and today you're here and you see the pastor driving and you go, what's the pastor? Oh, no. On that very day will be your best day. So surrender to him, knowing that your life is going to end with happily ever after, no matter what. So if you're going through a hard time now, know that at some point, the wicked stepsisters get what's coming to them. God noticed all your chores. He knows you mess up, and yet He allows you to know Him and love Him. So do that today. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you can do that today. Jesus died for you. Why? Because He loves you. He cares about you. He traded His life for yours. You can be redeemed. So if you want to do that, I'll be here after the service and you can surrender your life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and as I talked about your value, maybe that's your struggle. Maybe your struggle is that you're going through something. Maybe you know somebody's going through something. Hey, make that a prayer of your heart. Lord, would you help my friend to understand how valuable they are to you and help them to walk through this difficulty. I love you guys. Thanks for being here this morning. If you need prayer, I'll be here after the service. We're going to have a song now in just a moment and our time of giving, but let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love for us. Lord, I thank you for the story of Esther that reminds us that in all things, your hand is working behind the scenes. Lord, there's folks here today going through a struggle, going through a trial. And Lord, 
You are preparing them for blessing. So I pray that we would surrender to the test, that we would surrender to the quiz, that we'd surrender to the things you want us to do. Change us, make us more like you today. Father, I also pray for that one who doesn't realize how loved they are. That they would know that they're more valuable than their parents think. They're more valuable than anybody around them thinks because you love them with everything. May they walk in that love today. Thank you for this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.